I want to title my message today, If My People Prayed. If My People Prayed. It comes from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. God is saying, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. I want you to look at one more scripture in the Bible. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30 says, I looked for someone among them who would build a wall. I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it, but I have found no one. I want you to see two things. In the, two things. Number one, God's desire is to heal and not destroy. Come on. God's desire is not to destroy, but to heal. And number two, God is looking to do it through someone. Come on. My Bible says, if my people would humble themselves and pray. You know, Pastor Vlad said, mentioned something about fasting. You know, fasting is a biblical way to humble ourselves. And then the second one is prayer. God's desire is to heal and not destroy, and God is looking to do it through someone. I want you to look at a couple more scriptures in the Bible. Exodus chapter 19, verse 6 says, God proclaimed that his people would be a kingdom of priests. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, But you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And Revelations 1, 6 says, He has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. So God has called us his people priests. Come on. We are a kingdom of priests. There's something there. I want you to catch something. God is communicating something to us. You see, a priest is one who is duly authorized to minister in sacred things, particular to offer sacrifice at the altar who acts as a mediator between men and God. And we can see what a lot of priests, what they look like and what the things they did in the Old Testament. So if God has made us a kingdom of priests, what does this look like in the 21st century? Come on. What does that look like? Should we start walking out around in black robes, chanting, maybe become popes, you know, walking around with crosses? Should we start building altars of stone and sacrificing animals on it? No, of course not. In Jesus, we don't need to build no altar of stone and we don't need to sacrifice animals. But I do believe that God is looking for each one of us to become prayer warriors. That each one of us would become praying people. Because a priest is someone that comes before the Lord on behalf of himself or be on behalf of the people. So 24th century priests were people that send spiritual substance prayers up to the heavens on behalf of themselves and others. I want you to see the scripture what Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1. He says, first of all, then I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions and thanksgiving be offered for everyone. There's something that God is looking for from us people. That's prayer. You see, God wants to do something on this earth, but he needs substance. You see, God has given the earth to man. God is the biggest gentleman. He doesn't intervene without permission. He respects our space. He has given the earth to us. Now, you see, even in the Lord's prayer, he's, he included this. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Meaning God has inserted this in the Lord's prayer that when we pray, we're inviting God to come into this world. 
We're giving God permission to move on behalf of our lives. He's a gentleman. He doesn't just want to step in and, and uh, move and do stuff. He needs permission. He needs substance. That's why he's saying, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray. When you pray, you're inviting God to come into your world. God is looking for a man who would build the wall. But he says, I found no one. Meaning God doesn't want to destroy. He wants to heal that marriage. He wants to heal that disease. But he's looking for substance to move. Look in the Bible. Until a cry, prayer went up into the throne room of God, God didn't rescue his people through Moses. Do you know God came to Abraham and said, Abraham, your children are going to be enslaved for 400 years in Egypt. Did you know that they were enslaved for 430 years? Why 30 more extra years? Why? Until a cry came up to the throne room of, of grace. God didn't release Moses. You see, church, when we pray, we're sending spiritual substance into the heavens. It's like water evaporating and forming little puffy, puffy things in heaven. You know, clouds, you know, water evaporates and goes into the heavens and, and forms clouds. And when enough substance is collected, what happens? Exactly. It rains back down. What goes up must come down. Can I ask you a question, Miss, Mrs. and Mr. Priest? Because that is who we are. Can I ask you a question? We are priests. I want to, I want to ask, ask you a question. Are you sending enough substance up so that your God would rain, rain down on your children, on your family, on your business, on your marriage, on your career? Are you sending enough substance up into the throne room of grace? Come on. Come on. You know, we want revival. But are you sending substance up? I, are those clouds getting heavy? Or are they, are they hollow? Come on, somebody. I want to show you something. You know, I want to show you something. In heaven, read the book of Revelations. In heaven, they are, there is bowls or jars. They're called the prayers of the saints. Look at Revelation chapter 5 verse, verse 8. It says, golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And when they get filled, an angel takes it and does something with it. Let's look at what, what happens. Revelation chapter 8, verse 3 to 5. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the th throne. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up before from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it, with fire from the altar and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunders, rumblings, flashings of lightning, and an earth, earthquake. God took prayers, what the angel did, throw it down, earthquakes, things started to happen. As I said, when we send substance into heavens, like the clouds, they get formed, they start to rain. Our children start to get saved. Bodies start, tend to start to get healed. Come on, somebody. Come on. Church, I am not preaching to you a fairy tale. I'm not making up a sermon. This is what happens in heaven. We want revival, but send substance. God wants to move. God wants to move. He's mobilizing people if my people prayed. God wants to do something in your life. God wants to move 
in your life. But I want to ask you a question. Is your jar of prayer empty or is it filled? Come on. Because my Bible says that those jars in heaven, they were full of incense, of prayer. You know, you might be crying and complaining, God, why aren't you moving in my life? Why are you not moving that mountain? God, why, why have you not sent me a husband yet? Where's my wife? God, why, I need breakthrough in my life. And God's saying, hey, 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 come on, son, daughter, I want to move in your life. Send me some substance in heaven so I can make some kind of thunderings happen. Come on, do you need some things to be blown? Some enemies to be scattered in your life? Is your jar full or is it empty? Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer. He didn't say it's going to be a house of entertainment. Now, I'm not talking about just a church building because the Bible says we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. You know, in the Old Testament, God dwelled in the building. But in the New Testament, God dwells in our hearts, in our spirits. And, and Jesus says, my house will be called a house of prayer. We are the house. We are the priests. There's got to be fire on our altar. Come on, somebody. You know, in heaven, you know what God's going to say? Son, daughter. Why weren't you spending time in prayer? Oh, Lord, Lord, I was so busy. You know what God's going to say? Give me your iPhone. Let me check your screen time. Hey, 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 come on. Do you know how much hours we spend on, on, on our phone, on social media, YouTube, watching this funny clip, and we become houses of entertainment instead of houses of prayer? Come on, somebody. God is stirring up his body because he wants to move. He doesn't want the land to be destroyed. He wants to bring healing, but he needs substance. We fill ourselves up with entertainment. We distract ourselves with the pleasures and cares of this world. And then we wonder why I don't walk in the fire of God. Why God is not moving in my life? Why are my children going into the world and not serving God? God, is our jar empty? Is our jar empty or is it filled? Because God wants to rain revival down. I want us to take a look at some people that fill their jar with prayer and what that looks like. I want us to take a look at somebody in the Bible. His name was Job. Let's look at Job's life. Job in the Old Testament prayed and offered sacrifice for his family, for his children. He prayed constantly for his children. Maybe my children have sinned against the Lord God. And he offered sacrifice and offered sacrifice. He prayed. He interceded for his family. And you know something interestingly, because when Satan came up, before the Lord, hear what Satan said in Job chapter 1 verse 10 in the New Living Translation says, Satan says this, you have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You have made him prosperous in everything he does. Look how rich he is. Job was sending spiritual substance into the heavens and there was a hedge of protection over his children. Come on, somebody. Let's take a look at somebody else in the Bible. Let's take a look at Daniel in the Old Testament. You know, Daniel in the Old Testament, he prayed three times a day. Come on, church. We eat three times a day. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Some of us, we eat more. Did you know that Daniel... He was 10 times better than all the magicians. 
And throughout four different kingdoms, you know, because this kingdom overtook this kingdom over throughout four different kingdoms, Daniel rose to the top because he had an excellent spirit in him. Do you know that Daniel wasn't even born again like we are? Do you know that Daniel wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit like we are? But Daniel would rather pray and not miss prayer. He would rather he would rather be in the lion's den than miss prayer. And some of us, we would rather watch entertainment than pray. You ain't thrown in no lines then. You you thrown into Netflix. You thrown into YouTube, social media. And you rather do that than pray. But hear me out, church. Daniel was sending substance into the heavens. And when the time came in his trial, God showed up strong in his life. You know, church, we have a thing inside of us. It's, it's called a spirit because we're spirit, soul, and body. And God will, and God will help me maybe speak about this. It's a very important subject. Hear me out, church. You got to feed your spirit. You know, we feed our bodies three times a day. We eat, we eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner because, you know, we care about our bodies and, and all that. But we, do we care about our spirit as much? Because if you cared about your spirit as much, you would pray a little bit more. Read the Bible a little bit more because it's your spirit that needs to grow. It's your spirit that needs to pray. It's your spirit that needs to come alive. And we overcome by the spirit. Come on, church. When we stop praying, we get out of tune with our spirits. You see, because God doesn't dwell in our soul. God does not dwell in our physical body. God dwells in our spirits. And so when you stop praying, you get out of tune with your spirit. And you know what? Your spirit doesn't scream to you like your flesh does. You know, when you don't feed your body, you don't give it food, and your body's like, feed me! Your spirit gets silent. And then it doesn't scream. And then you know what happens? You become a soulish, a flesh-dominant person. Or another word, carnal Christian. Come on. When, you, when we stop praying, we get out of tune with our spirit. And we become carnal Christians. We lose sharpness in spirit. We become sluggish, fleshly, carnal Christians. Come on. And then what happens? Gossip, drama, entertainment, the things of this world become more attractive than the things of the world. Our spirits go to sleep and our flesh wakes up. Hi. I want us to take us I want us to take a look at sleep. The, the word S, sin willfully, L, lack of love, E, empowered by the flesh, E, entangled with the affairs of this life, P, prayerless life. Your spirit goes to sleep and your flesh wakes up and then you wonder, Lord, how did I get myself in this mess, you stop praying. You stop building your spirits. You became a carnal, fleshly Christian. And when we're not praying, church, the devil is praying. Now, he's not praying as P-R-A-Y. He is praying as P-R-E-Y. The devil is looking for someone to devour. When we're not praying, the devil's praying. I want to tell you a story. There was a pilot. He was taken off into flight. I think he was going into battle. And there was a snake that wrapped around the wheel of the pilot's plane. And, and he couldn't close the wheel. And he remembered. His dad told him. 
His dad took him camping. Can we show that picture? His dad told, showed him, you see, there's a mountain and there's a, there's a line that past that line, there's a different oxygen. Below that, there's oxygen. So snakes live below there. Higher up is a different oxygen level, meaning snakes don't dwell there. So instead of taking his plane down, he took his plane up. And when he passed that snake line, the snake simply fell off and let go. And he was able to shut his wheel on the plane. And one man of God, God spoke to this man of God, says, you know, my people have been living below the snake line. Some have snakes and snakes biting in the problems, this problem, that, this and this, this and that. Well, what would happen if you would take your plane, go up higher? You know, send more substance into the heavenly beings. Start praying for your children. Start praying for your family. Start praying for your marriage. Start praying for all that stuff. Send your plane higher. Come on. That's good. You could take that picture off. Jesus was sinless, but he prayed often. You know, if prayer was not important, Jesus would not waste time on it. Jesus won the battle in prayer before he won the battle on the cross. And something his followers asked Jesus was teach them to pray. The early church, they devoted themselves to prayer, meaning they found time in their busy schedules to pray. They prayed daily, constantly, corporately, and in person. For a believer, prayer should be like breathing. It needs to be a normal part of his, his or her lifestyle because prayer is not a wasted time. Hear me out, church. Prayer is not a wasted time. It's an investment into your present and into your future. Prayer shifts the spiritual world. You know, this young man was saying that his mom was a prayer warrior. I can testify some of my salvation has been, I, I would attribute it to the prayers of my family members praying for me and the Holy Spirit working behind the scenes, drawing my heart toward Jesus. And there was a time I surrendered my life. Come on. God is looking for prayer people to send substance into the heavens. People fail, man or woman of God fail, number one, because they don't pray, and number two, because there's no one praying for them. Hear me out, church. Men or woman of God fail, number one, because they don't pray, and number two, because no one is praying for them. Because when we're not praying, the devil is praying. Did you know that throughout eight different letters, nine, if the book of Hebrews was attributed to Apostle Paul, hear me out, church. Throughout eight times, Apostle Paul says, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me that words would be given me. Romans chapter 15, verse 30 says, Dear brothers and sisters, I urge you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to join my struggle by praying to God for me. 1 Thessalonians 5, 25. Brethren, pray for us. Ephesians 6, 19. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I would fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may proclaim it fearlessly as I should. There's something about it when you pray for others. Come on. And you know that the early church, they prayed for their leaders. I want us to see a story in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 10, 12, verse 1 says, Now, about that time, Herod the king 
stretched out his hand to harass them from the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to further to seize Peter also. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in pre prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant earnest prayer was offered to God for him by the church. So Herod seized James. Actually, James, the brother of John, died with the sword. And then they captured Peter, and Peter was in prison, and the church was earnestly, constantly praying for Peter. God spare his life. God spare his life. And substance was going up into heaven. And you know what happened if we read down the story? The angel comes, rescues Peter supernaturally, and there was a miracle. But you know, my Bible doesn't say the church was praying for John or James. And he died. What if the church would be praying for James and John? Maybe James and John would not die. But does it have to be a tragedy to wake us up as a church to pray? Do you need a problem in your life for, to wake you up that you need to come down on your knees? Come on. Don't, don't start praying. You know, you're driving in the car. You got a spare tire. You go to your tire. And you're, okay, let's take Jesus out now and put him in the, in the wheel. And then God fix your problem. You're, okay, Jesus, let's go back into that place. You're in, you're in the trunk, you know. Why do we have to pray when only we have problems in our life? But we as a church, we're going to cover our pastors. We're going to cover our ministers. We're going to cover them. You know, God is going to empower us to pray to send substance into the heaven so that our pastors, our leaders would be covered by the blood of Jesus. Amen. The early church, they prayed for their leaders. It's time to cover our pastors, our leaders in prayer instead of throwing rocks, complaining and gossiping about them. God bless Job double when he prayed for others. Do you know that? God blessed Job doubled when Job prayed for his friends. Instead of praying for himself, he prayed for his friends. God blessed him doubly. I want to tell you about a, about a story. It happened, in, I believe, in the 1700s, 1800s. There was a man of God. His name was Charles Finley. And when Charles Finney would come into a town, revival would break out. Everybody knew about Charles Finley, but not a lot of people knew about Daniel Nash or another people called him Father Nash. You see, Father Nash, before Charles Finley would go into a town, uh, Daniel Nash would find some like people, you know, like him, and they would rent a cottage, a, a building, and they would go down into the basement. They would fast and they would pray. You know, uh, one time Charles Finley came into a, to that town and uh, the, the woman of the house, she says, um, I, I got to tell you about these, uh, these people. They're down there. They're groaning. They haven't ate anything. They, they're like, just leave them alone. They, they are, they're praying. <laughs> and so when Charles Finley come, would come into that city, revival would break out. People would get saved, healed, delivered. But you know what's interesting is after Father Nash, after Daniel died, did you know that Charles Finley ministry went like, <sighs> interesting, huh? Because there was somebody sending spiritual substance into the heavens. And you know, Charles Finley was just used by God to heal the sick or to bring salvation message. But Daniel Nash was the one that was bringing breakthrough in the spiritual realm for revival. Come on, church. You don't have to be on the stage for revival to happen in this church. And hear me out, church. There will be more healings, deliverances, salvation credited to those that pray probably more than the person that was used to save, heal, or deliver. They will get their reward. 
But the person that prayed, that interceded, that sown, sown into the heaven, God will credit it to your account. Come on. And let me tell you, church, what's not rewarded on earth will be richly rewarded in heaven. Because prayer is a ministry. It's a, you know, nobody sees it a lot of times. It's somewhere out, somewhere who knows where, you know. It's, it's not like a glorious ministry where you fire lightning and all that kind of stuff. But God will reward those that prayed. And I want to give you my final thoughts before we wrap this up. Your spirit needs to pray. Your spirit needs to pray. Your inner man needs to be awakened from the sleep. Your mouth is a weapon. There's authority in your voice. Your flesh might be weak, but the Holy Spirit is ready to help and assist you in your weakness. And the greatest prayer partner that each one of us has is the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. He's given to you as a prayer partner, and he's given you a language where you can come to the throne room of grace, connect with him on another level. Don't tell me you can't pray. Just yield yourself to the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, when we speak in those tongues, our spirit prays. And when we don't know how to pray, the spirit intercedes on our behalf. You can pray. You just got to kick out all the excuses. Don't allow distractions to take you out of prayer. Telling you there's more important things to do. You're just wasting time. Start filling those bowls in heaven with prayer. You know, as a young man, I spent a lot of time in my car praying for my future. God, go before me in the area of my marriage. Go before me in the area of my finances. Go before me in the area of my health. Go before me. I, God, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the right decision to make, who to marry, this and that. And you know, I spent quite a bit of time praying, sending spiritual substance into the heavens. And you know, I can testify, God has given me a beautiful wife, beautiful children, beautiful home, beautiful, a lot of things. And that's the grace of God. I'm not saying that, that you, we buy things with prayer, but what I'm saying is send spiritual substance into the throne room of grace. And may God answer your prayers with peals of thunders, rumblings, flashings of lightnings, and earthquakes. May all your problems be solved with the solutions of heaven. May all your spiritual enemies be scattered. And I want to leave you the last scripture today is in Luke chapter 21, verse 36. You know, Jesus talks about the end times. And talks about the difficulties in the end, end times. And he says these words to us. He says, be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen so that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. He says, be watchful and pray so that you would be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you would be able to stand before God. Come on. You see, when we pray, God gives us spiritual strength. God gives us revelation. God gives us wisdom, oil. You need oil. But if your jar is empty, you're empty. A lot of us, we want somebody to pray for us. And, and that has a place and that has a season but your jar must be filled. You're, you're a priest. God calls us priests. You must pray. God wants to answer your prayer. God wants to do something in your life and your children and those around you. And, you, and those around you that need help, pray for them also. Because God wants to move and heal and, and touch them also. Not just your own family, but people around you. Pray. We are called to live a life of prayer and may your house be filled with prayer and may the fire on your altar never go out.